Good afternoon, family. Thank you so much, Andre, for that powerful welcome. I was brought to tears because this moment I have waited for for almost 10 years. For those of you who don't know, my name is Michael Peterson, and I have the privilege and honor to be in the AMS region in the mighty city of Angels. Nine and a half years ago, I was at my first UFC, Prophets and Kings 2013, right down the street. And there were so many amazing sessions about faith and how, how to maneuver our discipleship. But there wasn't something specifically for me that had to do with the cross that I was carrying. In 2014, in the AMS region, we did a movie about a young man coming out of a homosexual life. And I remember Chris Klopek asked me, Michael, are you willing to play this character? And originally I told Chris, no. I had no desire to be the face of this for the kingdom. Because I already was dealing with it so much in the world. And I prayed about it. And I had a conversation with God. I said, you know what, God? I'm willing to do it. And after that movie, I received messages from around the world. As we planted churches from Hong Kong, India, and Australia. And initially, it was incredibly overwhelming. Because how could I, one, one man, take this job, this calling, and do it? People now were looking to me to give them inspiration. Not knowing I'm a complete mess. Bro, you give me vision. You give me inspiration. I hope you find that from the cross. Because I'm flawed. I got issues that I got issues. There's a reason I, I'm a disciple. Because baby, I was lost. I want to give you a little bit of background about myself. The youngest of five, born in a fatherless home, I've experienced every abuse you can think of, physical, sexual, verbal, insecure. And then what happened is I had a dream to go to Los Angeles and become a dancer. I lost a lot of weight. I was a football player in high school, the D tackle. Then I went to the ballet bar. And I got kind of cute. And I called Space Pig. And I took that. The body that God had given me, and I ran it through the mud with immorality and impurity. On, Trying to add value to myself on these meaningless interactions. Yeah. It is truly a dream to be speaking you, to you today, and I want to commend you for being here. <laughs> because it takes bravery and courage to be willing to say, this is in my life and I need help. Having to deal with the reality is there's not many people who know how to navigate this in the kingdom. But you're here today. Whether you deal with it or not, maybe you're here on behalf of somebody else. I want to commend you. I'm not sure if you've been able to see what's happening in our world thus far, but I want to share some statistics with you about what's been happening with the LGBTQ community. I want to share some stats. Last February 2021, the Washington Post shared that one out of every six Gen Zers identified on the LGBT spectrum. This was only a year and a half ago. This last February in 2022, it went from one in every six to one in every five. 20%. Newsweek shared at the end of last year that nearly 40% of the youth in America identify on the spectrum. The Indoctrine Society recommended that kids start taking hormones around age 16 and even as early as 13 and 14 to stop their natural puberty cycle so they can begin to transition. And the scariest part of that 40% is that 30% of them identify as Christian. We have to be prepared to give an answer. Are you with me, family? We have to save these people because these people are not strangers. They 
are you and I. They are our friends, our family members, our co-workers, and possibly our future children if we do not act now. We are at war. They are, it is in our governments, there are policies now that more and more they have a transgender woman as the head of health in the U.S. In Seattle, someone can begin transitioning at four years old without parental consent. My daughter is three and a half years old, and if I asked her if she wanted to be a balloon, she would tell me yes. A child at four years old does not have the mental capacity to decide if they want to change their gender, but it is happening right here, right now, and we have to be awake. We have to address the elephant in the room. During the pandemic, I got into therapy. And through my conversations with Elizabeth, my therapist, she said, Michael, as a man of faith, understanding how forgiving God is and how it is a staple in your faith, why is it so hard for you to forgive yourself? I couldn't forgive myself because I wanted resolution for what had happened and got me to that place. My innocence was taken from me. I was put in these scenarios and these situations and I couldn't forgive myself because I wanted more power and more control in the situation and I did not act. I was nine years old when I had a family member's genitalia in my mouth. No child should ever experience such things. But it was my reality. I thought I should have been stronger in that moment. I should have been better. I should have said something. But what is a kid to do at nine years old experiencing that? The scariest part was that the beginning part of my 20s, I didn't even remember, remember that it happened. But I saw this person at a family function and I was overwhelmed. I had to leave because all of the memories were flashing back of what had happened to me, what had been done to me. But today I'm here to tell you that you have the opportunity to heal from that and to get help through God, the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit. But today, family, we have to kill the sinful prejudice that still remains here in the kingdom. Because the reality is, is that most times when these things come up, people feel weird about it and they pull away. I'm here to tell you that Satan has tried to convince you that you are nothing more than your desires and that lie comes straight from the pit of hell. I'm here to tell you that you can heal from your broken heart because God is close to those who are crushed in spirit. Today we are at the summit of overcoming by the power and the grace of the Almighty God and that is today's sermon is overcoming same-sex attraction. Point number one, overcoming through honesty. The conversations that I've had with many disciples have most times happened on the side, behind the scenes, in text messages and phone calls because they are afraid of speaking their truth to the people that are in their ministries. I can't tell the brothers in my household because they're going to think of me differently. They're going to treat me differently. In Hebrews 4, starting in verse 12, the Bible reads, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Every thought, every temptation and attitude can be seen and heard by the Almighty God. So why are you trying to hide what cannot be hidden? The best thing I have ever done in my relationship with God was to bring my truest self to Him because He could handle it and was willing and ready to accept it. You're waiting for your roommates, your friends, the people in your ministry to accept you. You do not require or need their acceptance. God is sitting there ready and willing to accept you as you are. God is not surprised by your sinful 
whole life. He has already done the math and sent Jesus before you to accept you, to love you, to help you, and to heal you. In John 4, 23 and 24, it says that the, God is looking for true worshipers that will worship here in spirit and in truth. But the interesting thing is that lowercase we are one of the definitions in the lexicon is the inner man. The soul. God is looking for people who are willing to worship him from the inside. To worship him on a soul level. The only kind of worshiper God is looking for is that, is that person that's willing to submit to him on a soul level. How is your soul doing this morning? If the Bible is sharp enough to divide even something that can not even seem different, like a thought and an attitude, it can separate you from your preconceived notions about your identity and sexuality. Because these two things, they can feel so similar. I am my identity. I am these desires. And before the Bible and before the scriptures, all of that was true. But the moment you step into a relationship with God, you receive a new identity. As it says in Ephesians 2, we become part of God's household. So the moment, as it says in Romans 1, Romans 6, 1 through 4, when I went down and I came back up, I no longer was me, but Christ who lives inside of me. I am defined by, the, by who bought me, which is the blood of Christ. I'm no longer defined by what I did, who I did, whatever I did. I stand before you saved and sanctified. Are you with me this morning? The word of God has enough power and specificity to address and divide those two things. But the reality is, in that, that community, there is a deep pitted fear. That if I were to do this, how can I be sexually satisfied? We have to overcome through honesty this morning, church. But you have to ask yourself, where did your immorality leave you? It left you alone. It left you destitute and desperate, full of depravity and empty of God. And guess what? It still left you wanting more. Interaction after interaction after interaction after interaction. I do not know how many times I submitted my body to immorality. It is innumerable. Because there is an abyss inside my soul that can only be filled with God. And after five and a half years of marriage, Christian marriage, I can tell you one thing and one thing clearly. I'm satisfied. This isn't something, this isn't a far off concept. I'm speaking from experience, praise God. I have two children and one on the way. Because Satan wants to convince you that your sin is better than righteousness. Because that person knew how to scratch an inch for a moment. How about a lifetime into eternity? Because there's going to be a lot of itchy people in hell. Are you with me this morning? This morning, I want to try to convince, this afternoon, I want to convince you of who you are in the eyes of God. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, loved and adorned and cherished and admired. You are to die for. So my sexuality had to take on a new face before God. The goal and ambition of someone in a homosexual lifestyle is not for them to be heterosexual, it is to be holy. Stop trying to sell them on something they don't want to buy. People are not coming to church to find a spouse but a savior. I didn't come to church looking for a wife, I was looking to be one. 
That may sound weird, brothers, but you are the bride of Christ. <laughs> Sorry about it. I got to me a man. Come on. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Are you with me this afternoon? 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 18, the Bible reads, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts to rest in his presence. In our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and we receive from him everything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus, to love one another as he has commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. One of the things is that people feel like, well, one day if I get married, what if I fall, in, what if I fall out of love with my spouse? What if they no longer desire me? Regardless of dealing with same-sex attractions, those things can happen in any marriage. You see, that's one of the, the tricks of the devil. He tries to make you feel, in a sense, special. That nobody can understand that somehow these things are different, but sin is sin. When God looks at the world, he doesn't see heterosexuals and homosexuals. He sees disciples and non-disciples. There is no separation. There is no worse sin, better sin. And if you think so, I would encourage you to get in the scriptures. Point number two is overcoming through adversity. In the first year of my marriage, God blessed me with heartbreaking adversity. And I say I'm blessed now because I'm on the opposite side. Satan tried to convince me that the adversity that was present in my marriage was proof that I could not ever be married to the opposite sex. But adversity is a gift from God. Because I had to learn how to fight my sin and my mistakes. I had to learn how to fight when I didn't feel like it, when I didn't want to, when I felt like God wasn't showing up, when I was sad, when I was defeated. I had to fight for my faith. Are you with me this afternoon? I had to learn how to bring the worst part of me forward and be honest. Because you cannot afford to be worried what other people think about your sin. Because hell just ain't worth it. I've watched many disciples who could not manage the testing of their faith, and so they started looking at other options. I've had to share my worst fail failures in the kingdom. But I had people like Artie and April Baker, John and Nemikazi, Stacy Lynette Yabara, Tim and Leanne Kernan, Paul and Kim Hammond, and they loved me all the more. In 2016 at South in South and we had a night of atonement and I, I felt God and the Holy Spirit put on my heart share this with the men and I stood up before the men and at December 15th 2015 I had been diagnosed HIV positive and I had been baptized in 2013 so you can do the math I, I contracted this potentially fatal STD as a disciple. And I stood in front of all the men, weeping. I said, brothers, I had given my body over to immorality and I failed God and I'm HIV positive. And I hung my head low. And as I lifted my head, every man in the room had surrounded me. And everyone hugged me and they embraced me. 
because I was honest and I was forthright. And ever since that day, I have not stopped telling people what I did to myself and what God did through it. I want to call you tonight to kill your pride and start walking out with honesty and transparency so that Satan might lose power. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Again, the second point is overcoming through adversity. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 7, the Bible reads... But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we are alive, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is also at work in you. I'm not going to sit here and try to convince you that the last nine and a half years have been easy because they've been quite the opposite. It's been almost a decade of fighting over and over again. I don't know if you've ever read Psalm 73, but Asaph had it right. That first half, at least, where you're just waking up and you're overwhelmed. But God did not promise us painless lives. He promised us that he would utilize our pain. You see, on, on the end of every single painful situation is a promise and a purpose in the eyes of God. Five and a half years ago, five years ago, excuse me, I was asked to preach at the GLC in Manila for the AMS session. And my wife recorded the lesson and she posted it on Facebook. And I don't know how this person even had my Facebook, but all of a sudden someone came into the comments. Isn't that, isn't Michael gay? Now some disciples valiantly came to my, came to my defense. I mean, I have shared what some of them shared them. Were, were, some of them were some new converts there. I know you're talking about my brother. I was like, oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> but part of me was like, get him, sis. Because <laughs> I can't say that, but you can. <laughs> and we're just going to blame it on your young Christianity, amen? <laughs> I'm going to let you fall on that sword. <laughs> But then what happened was when he saw people come to defend, he dug down deep and started making things up. Accusation after accu accusation in the comments and I realized that it was no longer about me that I now represented an entire family, including my wife. And I remember looking Jasmine in the eyes and I was weeping because I was so embarrassed for her. That now, the shame that I carried in my life now is reflected upon you. And I felt so guilty and ashamed. And my wife being, I'm not going to cry, y'all. My wife, being who she was, looked me in the eye. She said, I've already counted every cost. <laughs> but the weight and the reality of my life continue to grow. Because now I have children. And I've had to pray with sorrow in my heart. For my daughter and my son. My son. God, allow them to be strong enough to bear my shame. On, that they can still be proud of their father in the midst of my mistakes. And I love my children. But I know the best thing that I could ever do for them is to fight through the adversity. 
is for them to watch the world beat me up and for me to stand up in my relationship with God. So I could teach them that even when the world spits on you, they spit on Jesus too. When they drag your name through the mud, then I'm amongst good company because they did the same thing to my God. Are you with me this morning? Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. Thank you, my brother. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. And those who have heard me preach know that this is a, a scripture that I frequent. I should get some spiritual reward points for how many times I use this scripture. That's like, he goes to that one a lot. First Peter chapter 5 verse 10 it says, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. And the church said, amen. amen. You see, but sometimes you got to be a little bit of a Bible geek and you got to start digging into the scriptures. Because in the NIV, this word is restored, but in a different translation, the word is perfect. And the definition of this word perfect in the Greek is defined, is defined as to make one who they ought to be. So if I'm reading the scripture correctly, it says after you have suffered a little while, will Christ himself make you who you ought to be? It is only on the opposite end of suffering will you truly be who you're meant to be in God. And I don't know how long a little while is, but I can't focus on the timeline. I have to focus on the promise that after the suffering will Christ himself make me who I ought to be. Adversity is a gift. Suffering is a gift. You can only look like Christ if you experience what he went through. You can only have fellowship with Christ if you're willing to suffer as he did. Are you with me this afternoon? Yeah. Let's turn the Bible to 2 Chronicles 16.9. Again, yes. Reward points for this scripture. I go to all the time. I hope you would have some reward points for how, how many scriptures you're in the Bible, amen? <laughs> Second Chronicles 69, the Bible reads, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those hearts who are fully committed to him. Yeah. See, just like God is looking for those true worshipers, God has strength on layaway for your fully committed heart. God is waiting for your full commitment. The reason that you have debated giving up on God is because you are still actually debating when you're going to allow God to be God. In those moments when it's difficult, how well are you holding John 8, 31 through 32? You see, God knows how to strengthen you, and God's not squeamish about it. God knew I needed a jasmine to strengthen me. So some of us here, we want to be married, but God cannot give you a spouse so that you can have, be married to lack of commitment? You, brothers, you want to be married, but you can't lead yourself yet. It is only when I got fully committed, December 15, 2015, I was diagnosed with HIV. Jasmine was one of the first people I told. And I had to have a conversation with myself. In that inner man, in, that, in my soul, I scoured the internet for the first 45 minutes trying to figure out if this was really happening. Called my sister, who's a nurse practitioner. Casey, what does this mean? She says, brother, it means you have HIV. I said, I'm not going to let this destroy my life. It's not going to destroy my day. And on the train ride to the gym, the sun was rising because I, I, I get up early. 
I said, God, I, I want to apologize for making you the face of my victimhood. Not understanding that the adversity that I have ex been experiencing, you were trying to train me and to strengthen me, and I let it beat up on me, and I send out. And I'm not leaving. I said, God, if this disease kills me in a year, I'm going to die faithful. If I walk on all of my years on this earth single, I'm going to stay faithful. Whatever comes my way, I'm going to stay faithful. In, that, in my heart, I make that decision. Four months later, I'm at Tim Kernan's house. I want to give you a full scholarship to ICCM. A month after that, I'm dating Jasmine again. You see, it doesn't take a long time for your full commitment to activate the strength. God is waiting for you to get fully committed to carrying your cross. Are you with me this afternoon? If you feel shame about your cross, you're in good company. Because it says that Jesus scorned the shame of the cross. Scorn is synonymous with hate. But he bored anyways. He stood up under it. My, my prayer for years has always been on that day when I stand before the throne. Is Jesus remember me? Earlier in my in my marriage, I was embarrassed that all the adversity that we were going through, that my love for my wife wasn't enough to sustain me, that I had begun to idolize, not even knowing it as a single person, idolizing marriage, idolizing who I wanted to be in my marriage, idolizing who I wanted my wife to be in my marriage. It was embarrassing to say it wasn't enough, but it was a gift. Now I'm grateful because it killed the romanticism in my relationship with God. Because no marriage with God or with another person can live off of romanticism. And some of you here romanticize your relationship with God. Someone lied to you and said it was going to be daisies because God is gracious and merciful. But there's, that is not in the scriptures. So I want to convince you today that as God presents you with adversity, he is loving you and loving you deeply. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. Point number three is overcoming through family. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Now this part's going to be twofold. In verse 19 it says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. You don't have to deal with same-sex attractions to relate. To those, who, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. You also don't have to become worldly, amen? amen. In verse 22, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. Paul understood that life experience wasn't enough to bridge the gap. So the first I want to address the people who do not resonate or relate with having same-sex attractions. The Bible states clearly that Jesus was tempted in every way. You understanding is not required. Amen. Paul decided to take a page out of the Bible and decided to become a walking mirror. Whoever was in front of him, he said, I'm going to become just like this person. So when a brother or sister gets open, you, open with you about their struggles, relating isn't as complicated as Satan would think you to have it. So if a brother is sharing how he's left, lusting after maybe another man, why are you acting like you've never been in lust before? 
when someone's sharing that they're dealing with impurity, why are you trying to act like you're not currently addicted to pornography? It's not different. It is the same. Sin is sin. And you have to stop trying to make it make sense. You cannot rationalize sin. The math will never math. The next is for people who do deal with same-sex attractions. You do not have the right to marginalize your brothers and sisters because they just don't get it. God is placing you in that relationship so it can be a two-way teaching relationship. They learn with you as you learn with them. That is how we get better. The Bible says that we belong to one another. You don't have the right to say, I don't need you because you don't understand my struggle. That is unbiblical. It is demonic. It's satanic. And we have to get it out of the church. Are you with me this afternoon? Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Are you still with me this afternoon? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible reads, Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body at a home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things we have done in the body, whether good or bad. I'm so grateful for the scriptures. You know, one of the scriptures I've had to keep in the forefront of my mind is that we regard no one from a worldly point of view. There's a, there's a story I want to share with you about a brother who's here in the GLC. His name is Pat Bouye Jr. He's in the Chicago church. Amen. And I was a song leader. And when I, when I first got baptized, I had very, very overt feminine mannerisms. I was a professional dancer, so I was in that world. And f uh, for a man to be feminine, and it's, it's, it's celebrated. It's exciting. And I had him walk with me in the parking lot, and he just asked me questions about my, my, my background, my history, my upbringing. And he said, bro, this makes a lot of sense. And I want to share something with you. And he, he brought up that he had seen these mannerisms. He said, bro, how can I help you? And I cried. There's been a lot of stories of me crying, I know. <laughs> but I'm faithful. Those tears kept me faithful. Some of us in here need to cry a little bit more. He said, I want to help you. I said, bro, keep me accountable. So we, so we figured out he, he would give me a look. But being song leaders, I'd be a little excited. He, <laughs> <laughs> to the point where this is a very real practical that I had to implement myself. I had to start speaking in the lowest register possible. Because I was used to speaking so high. Because I never wanted my past, 1 Corinthians 9, 19, I didn't, I wanted to be all things to all men. And if people were able to see that my past so overtly on me, they may not want anything to do with Christ. And I couldn't bear that weight. Yeah. So I said, it's on me to change my persona for the sake of the gospel. So if you deal with certain mannerisms that could hinder the gospel, you have to kill your pride because it's not about you, it's about the cross. It's about becoming all things to all men so that you might save some. So if you have to change your hair, change your outfit, change your nails, change how you speak, you better change it. So that Christ might be glorified. If you're walking with a switch, it's got to go. So that some might be saved. I hope you did not come here looking for a quick fix because I can't help you. I hope you did not come here thinking I was going to make your cross lighter because that is not my job. Because God is not going to save you from the thing that's meant to save you. 
Your cross is meant to bring you to Christ. You have to let that thing kill you so that God might resurrect you anew. So people think when they talk to me that somehow I had a Holy Ghost experience and I don't deal with this anymore. That's why he must be speaking. That's a lie. So am I still tempted with same-sex attractions? The answer is yes. But if you were to have my 20-year-old self up here, he would not believe what is happening. Because I'm so far removed from who that man was. Because of God, because of the scriptures. So yes, I have temptations here and there, but it is as almost as if my have temptations have given up on me because they know when they come here, they're going to be taken captive. They're going to meet the cross. They're going to meet the blood of Jesus. They do not stand a chance. They're going to be evicted immediately. We have no power here any longer. The old Michael who you used to talk to, he doesn't live here anymore. There's a new tenant and you can't stay. So today, family, I want to challenge you. Stop trying to take the easy way out and become a doorway for the world. Stop running away from all of your insecurities and your, and your hurts and to lean in. Stop making it about you and your comfort and get uncomfortable for Christ. I want to challenge you to step up to the plate so that LGBT can have a true meaning, so we can let God be true. I love you so much, and to God be the glory.